and uh, but no, I was uh, called to a meeting and told to go to uh, Boston and uh, set up a new arms network. But you know, and it wasn't you know, and I wasn't even told what to get, what to buy. Like there was no strategy that I could see. You know, I was even I was um, let me see, what's the best way to put this? I was uh, I was crestfallen for two reasons. One was that they seemed to think that for all the knowledge resources I had, the only real asset that I could provide the IRA was my accent. And the other one was that I presumed there was a strategy and they would tell me, you know, get this, get that, you know, so that we can carry out the strategy. But no, I was just told, go over there and get weapons. It was that vague. You know, I was given 9,000 Irish pounds, which is a derisory sum, and then sent off to Boston. Do you then question your decision making then? Well, it wasn't my decision making. My or to join the IRA, were you thinking you're maybe a bit more, in, not intelligent, but no. you wanted a wee bit more than just being used for your accent, basically? No, well, I certainly didn't think I was more intelligent. I mean, they, no. they were very intelligent guys. No, with the training you'd already done, like you're obviously, uh, you've gave up a, a life yeah. a, a, with a great opp jobs yeah. opportunities to then join the IRA. Like, yeah. Were you expecting more? Well, I was expecting to contribute more mm -hmm. than my accent. How old were you then? I'd have been uh, about 23. 23, 24. Well, oh, by the time I went to the States, sorry, about closer to 25. And you were just happy to go there? and Well, I wasn't happy to go there, but I, I was told to go, so I went. I, I was more or less given the option, you know, if I wanted to stay in the IRA, to go. You know, and you see, the IRA is very, very carpental. Like, car oh, um, yeah. I usually can pronounce that word, but you know what I'm saying? Yeah. And the thing about it is, um, uh, you, you, you didn't, you tended not to second guess people, you know, you just kind of hope there was a reason, there was a good reason that you couldn't see, you know? Mm -hmm. And uh, so I just, I followed orders and I went and uh, when I got to Boston, then I met, um, I was given half of, uh, half a $5 note that was caught in a very erratic way. And I was told that my contact over there had the other half of this $5 note. So when I got there, I met the person and I told them that, you know, we're going to need driver's licenses to buy guns, fake driver's licenses and other uh, resources. So that's when I first met James Whitey Bulger, the notorious, you know, gangster. But he wasn't notorious then. He wasn't notorious to me. I, I, I'd never met him. I didn't know who he was. Uh, excuse me. And um, so I met him and uh, he... Uh, he gave us a few guns and he gave us a little money, $5,000, something like that. It wasn't much. And, uh, but one of his men there, uh, Patney, who was originally from Ireland, was a, grew up in an Irish speaking house. His parents spoke fluent Irish at home. Uh, he'd been an ex Marine and we kind of clicked, we hit it off. And Pat was very enthusiastic about helping us. And so Whitey sort of gave the nod, but he wasn't really hands on Whitey like Patney was, you know. Patney did, did almost, you know, the real work in, you know, in expanding the operation to where we ended up with seven and a half tons of weapons and tens of thousands of rounds of ammunition, you know. Mm -hmm. But um, then uh, after some time, uh, but I have to emphasize about Whitey, you know, the, the Whitey thing was with all the books about him and all the movies about him and things like that now, and some of the nefarious activities he was at, like, we didn't know that. We knew he was a criminal, obviously, because he was able to, you know, break the law, get fake licenses, get guns. But we didn't know, like, the things he was doing that we later learned, you know, murdering people, pulling their teeth out, burying them in the basement, things like that. You know, obviously he wasn't going to tell us that stuff, you know. But, uh, so... But was he, he scared of him? Um, he was intimidating in a way. But he, he tried to um, build a rapport with me and other IRA guys. Uh, but at the same time, he had a sort of... Uh, barrier put up you couldn't get too close you couldn't get too friendly to him uh i remember a couple of times maybe engaging in a bit of banter a bit of friendly banter and he sort of pushed back a bit you know as if maybe you weren't respecting him you know i think he wanted you always a little bit in awe of him i wasn't in awe of this guy you know but you sort of had to play the game a little bit you know uh you know a lot of these people they have enormous egos enormous egos like off the charts and he certainly had you know and uh you know, if you want to get stuff done, if you want to get work done, if you want 
uh, him to cooperate and provide resources. Sometimes you got, just got to toe the line a little bit and, you know, say, oh, that's great, Jim. And Jim, that's a great idea. And, you know, this type of stuff. Mm -hmm. Kiss his ass if it had to, you know. Mm -hmm. It was for Ireland. Uh, <laughs> had to long, do it for Ireland. How long were you in America for doing that? Well, off and on. I, I'd be going back and forth off and on. I was there at one stage for three months. And then I'd be back in Ireland for a while. And then I was back a couple of no other months. And the longest time I was there was for nine months, right? But you see, we had, we were actually planning a much bigger operation, much bigger arms operation. And uh, there was a fellow down in New York, Liam Ryan, God rest him. He was later murdered by a uh, loyalist working on behalf of IEC Special Branch. And he went to Ireland and he met several members of the area leadership. And he came back with a note for me, a, a calm, a, a communication, we call it a calm. And I opened it and it said that I was to ring a phone booth in, in Dublin at a certain time on a certain day to receive instructions, which was quite unusual. We didn't use phones in that manner. Of course, there was no mobile phones or anything like that back then. But anyway, I, I did what I was told and I rang the number. I didn't recognize the voice on the other end. I had no idea who it was, but I knew he was somebody working on behalf of somebody in the area leadership. And he told me to come home now with everything you got and you be on the boat. And I remember he's very emphatic, you be on the boat, which I thought was very strange because I was never supposed to be on the boat in the first place because I had all the contacts. I had set up the network mm -hmm. uh, and we were, you know, uh, operating uh, on other projects to get, you know, heavier weapons and things like that. I wasn't afraid to be on the boat, nothing like that, but it was. I thought it was a very unusual order. But anyway, I then went to... Um, Patney and a couple of other the Boston guys over there and said, look, I just got an order. I, I got to go home now. With Thinking about it after, I, I, why didn't they just tell me to fly home and just tell me what was going on? But no, come now on the boat. But anyway, so what they did then is uh, we had been preparing a much bigger boat called the Surge, like the steel freighter. It's a big job, a lot of work, you know. So we had to go to a guy called Bob Anderson. Well, they went to him. I, I, I didn't know who this guy was. He was a fisherman. They offered him $10,000 to, you know, to use his fishing boat to take whatever guns we had across the Atlantic. And uh, so he was offered 10,000 and other in, other inducements like, you know, they were going to buy thousands of dollars worth of bait and things like that. He could sword fish on the way home and make tens of thousands of dollars from that and keep all the profit. Uh, and there was another guy called John McIntyre who was later murdered by Whitey Bulger. Uh, he was given $10,000 to, you know, to man the boat. And he was a bit of a jack of all trades, a fisherman, and he knew his way around the boats. Uh, even though I'd been in the Marines, I mean, I was, I was no fisherman, I was no sailor. So I was kind of dead weight on the boat, you know. But uh, anyway, we gathered everything up. We were given coordinates where to meet an Irish boat off the coast of Ireland. Uh, we left in, in September, in the middle of September, 1984, with about seven tons of weapons on board on this fishing boat that wasn't even supposed to cross the Atlantic, you know? It was a crazy stunt like, you know? And uh, we took off and uh, about halfway across the Atlantic, we hit a storm, a hurricane. It was actually a hurricane. And uh, I remember Bob Anderson, the captain, telling me that he'd been monitoring it on uh, coming up the Gulf Stream. And I remember thinking, you know, this is all we need now, you know? But when it hit, it was absolutely horrendous. It did tremendous damage to the boat, knocked out four of the seven tempered glass windows. Uh, we very, very nearly sank. I remember at one point asking Bob, should we put on the survival suits we brought along with us? And he said that um, we're, we, our communications have been knocked out because when water came in, the broken windows, it knocked out our radios and our navigation. So he says, we're in the middle of the Atlantic. We have no communications. Uh, nobody knows we're here. Put it on if you want, but it's just going to take you eight hours longer to die. So none of us put them on, you know? So that was a really hairy situation. I just thought we were just goners but anderson you know thanks to his uh 25 years fishing north atlantic and his skills as a boatman he he got us out of it but it was real touch and go i didn't think we were going to survive uh we managed to limp our way on then to meet another boat called the marina Anne, about 200 miles off the coast of ireland uh we were given a longitude and longitude where to be they were there a certain day in time we transferred the weapons and on our way in to kenmare bay to land the guns we were stopped by the irish navy and arrested and uh, we were brought to uh, Cork, interrogated, uh, charged, and then sentenced to 10 years in prison for that. You know, We were informed on uh, 
it later turned out that there was a senior IRA man called Sean O'Callaghan, who was a guard, police, Irish police, and MI5 agent. And he told them that we were coming. Uh, but the thing that I wonder about to this day is um, he told on our, he told on our location, but he wasn't the one who said, "Come now, bring everything, and you be on the boat." And to this day, I don't know who gave that order. So you don't know who phoned you? I have no idea. No, could because have, Liam Ryan, who gave me the message, was, was murdered afterwards. Could it have been police? No, it was. I, it was somebody. It was, I believe it was somebody high up in the area leadership. An informant? Absolutely, yes, I believe that because it, it, it was. It was made no sense. It, it, it screwed up everything. We were planning a much bigger operation. We were supposed to bring weapons from Libya. Uh, we had a freighter lined up for that. It, everything went down the tubes to bring over a bunch of basic, basic, basically junk that would have made no difference whatsoever to the IRA campaign. I swear to God, you know. So it's it's one of the mysteries of my life. Who gave me that order and why? Do you still get sleepless nights over that? Not sleepless, but I, the hardly a day goes by when I don't think about it, you know. So it's just... Uh, O'Callaghan told us, uh, you know, coming into Kenmare Bay, but he didn't, he wasn't the one that gave that order. Mm -hmm. um, <clears throat> after we were arrested, of course, the IRA set up an investigation and how we were arrested. And, uh, you know, the initial suspicion would have come on a mistake I made because I was told before I left that only six or seven men in Ireland knew about this operation. So if it went, you know, pear shaped, it had to be me for either trusting the wrong person or doing the wrong thing. It's basically told that, right? So I was getting messages in, you know, asking me, what did you do? Who did you talk to? And all this, the implication being it was our end. And I, I remember thinking, now, hold on a wee second, right? We were given a lo longitude and latitude where to be in the Atlantic. But I didn't know we were going to Kenmare Bay. I had no idea the boat coming out to me, this was the Marita Anne. I didn't know anybody on the Marita Anne. I didn't know where the boat in Ireland was based. We could have been going to Donegal. Sligo, Waterford, anywhere. No idea. Nobody in the American then knew either. But the Irish Navy knew, and they were waiting for us, and I know I didn't tell them. Mm -hmm. Now, we learned later that Sean O'Callaghan told them that we were coming to Kenmare Bay, but, like, he wasn't the one that told them. You know, he wasn't the one that told me to come now, bring everything, and you be on the boat. Mm -hmm. So it's one of the mysteries of my life, you know.